Fred Film Radio. I'm Matt Micucci from the 76th Venice International Film Festival. And I'm very pleased to be closing, wrapping up our round of interviews with the closing film of the festival, The Burnt Orange Heresy. And I have the pleasure of having here the filmmaker Giuseppe Capotondi and the two lead actors of the film. We've got Chris Bang. Hi. And Elizabeth De Vicky. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So just to start us off, for the, for the people, for the listeners who are not familiar with the film yet, I would just love to ask the director to maybe introduce it a little bit, just say a few words as much as you'd like. Yeah, I mean, it's a sort of a Faustian tale about ambition, power, abuse of power, mm. and truth in the form of a film noir. Excellent. So, I mean... Uh, a central element to this film, of course, is the depiction of the art world, and it seems to be like a very sinister art world. Is that correct? Well, the art world is more uh, a background for our uh, little story, really. Obviously, it has m very much importance, but I think the core theme is the truth in art, obviously, and in life. Not right. in politics, because that's impossible to achieve. You know? Well, yeah. Apparently. Especially now, right? Especially nowadays, Crazy times. everywhere you look. Crazy times. Is that what interested you about the original the source, the novel? Yeah, 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 of course, because it's about truth. And I think, you know, it's, it's now or never, you know. It's, it's the last times that we can talk about truth be without being, you yeah. know, possibly jailed. Exactly. So. I, well, you use the word film noir. I find the characters that you guys play wonderfully complex. Their identities are so mysterious all throughout. How do you get into characters like that? Uh, well, for me, what really drew me to Berenice is this, um, it was actually a sort of purity of her. And I found, um, you know, the entrance point for me with the character was um, how she struck me anyway on the page was, was a woman who had once um, really known herself and was sort of very true to her sense of self and self-worth and uh, had been really knocked off that pedestal and had sort of lost her sense of identity. And you meet somebody who's actually quite um, at sea um, and, and, and therefore very vulnerable uh, and looking for somebody to connect with and therefore sort of allowing herself to be projected upon and, and sort of let her identity come through the eyes of others. What that says about me, I don't know, but I definitely <laughs> did. Please tell. Uh, please, we don't have time. Um, but but I just, uh, I actually, you know, it's always a funny question when someone says to an actor, how did you get into the role? To be honest, when the role is that well written, it, it sort of reveals itself to you as you go along and, and it's only your privilege as an actor to sort of jump into it. It's not... Um, there are so many entrance points into a script like that, I think, f certainly the way I read her. And, um, and also testament to the writing that the more I read it, the more, the more the blueprint of who this person was sort of became apparent to me and little clues dropped in on the 10th reading, you know, and that's the joy of, of truly great writing. Mm. Please, what about you? Um, well, I, what, what I think there are sort of two, I mean, I... I the thing that I sort of, first of all, sort of identified with or looked, for, could, could, could sort of identify with in James was that this very ambitious, this he's driven very much by his ambition. But I actually also think that I, when I read it, I was, I found this relationship with these two characters really interesting. And I was like, oh, fuck, I can't wait to start shooting these scenes because they were so well written. And sometimes it's like, it's um, it's just good fun to do because it's I mean, so it's it's actually like a playground or something a little bit. It's like and and then you have a wonderful playmate and it's like you just it's it's sort of it's almost like it's just I mean how can am I getting paid to do this because this is actually really a lot of fun. Just I mean so it was it was the opportunity to go into this thing that that sort of also drew me to it because I I just. I just couldn't wait to get started on, on playing around with these scenes and to sort of see what we could make of it. And, um, and I thought that it was actually, we, well, I mean, it turned out to be as big a pleasure as, it, as I thought it would be, actually. Well, 
Giuseppe certainly drew up a, a, a wonderful playground for you guys to kind mm -hmm. of experiment in that sense, right? It's a bit yeah. timeless. There's a lot of cinema tradi tradition in it. It almost feels like it's a film that was made maybe in the 70s, very stylish. Yeah, that's what we try to do, actually, yeah. to be a little Hitchcockian, to play with the uh, tropes of the genre, yeah. uh, you know, the location and the... Uh, the beautiful, beautiful people. Exactly, <laughs> uh, that's uh, true. You know, they, Elizabeth and Claes, they look like, you know, m proper movie stars from, absolutely. you know, from, from the golden age of the cinema. You that's know. true, that's absolutely true. And Mick Jagger and Donald Sutherland are in the film as well? Yep. We're going to have to go because they're going to, uh, you wanted to say something? One no, final no, no, note. No, I'm fine, no, I'm okay. no, no, no. Thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, uh, this is Fred Plum Radio, the Festival Insider. Bye-bye.